I, all right, I'm back. Uh, there was a problem with the Wi-Fi, so I'm trying to use mobile data, which uh, is not ideal um, because it's obviously a bit more expensive. But uh, in the interest of science, we shall proceed. Um, so I hope this is watching now. Uh, this is working now. So yeah. So tonight, you know, I showed you that little clip of Jacques Minot. So, but we're going to move on from that because uh, what I wanted to share with you uh, tonight is something that is actually probably. Um, what makes the empirical sciences like virology, uh, why are they so doable and why we learn so much about them? It boils back down to, um, you know, the 1950s when uh, Watson and Crick famously solved the structure of DNA. And, you know, they were able to show that, uh, and once they knew the structure, they could almost immediately see how it worked. And very simply, and what it is, and what makes it so powerful is the linearity of it. And what I mean by linear is quite simply, um, you get a string of sequences, which is your genetic material, and that genetic material, you can immediately see from reading that sequence what the protein is gonna look like, all right? That's quite a thing. So you can immediately see there's a linear relationship between what the protein looks like and um, the sequence of the genetic material. And that is a really powerful thing. And, and with that, so once you know, so what, once they knew that, they were able to do a science that was very, let's say, tightly connected with, there wasn't too much conjecture. They could literally look at the sequence, predict what the protein was gonna look like. And then they've learned over time to make subtle changes in the protein. And what's really important about that is you can now, with those subtle changes, you can measure directly the changes you make. So if you're trying to understand some protein or some gene, you can change it. And the product, the, the, the result of the change is something you can directly measure. So you can see the change, you can observe the change, and you can directly measure it. And that's a very powerful thing. Basically, what, that is, what that's given us is what I call a linear response. So we literally have what's called a linear response, where we can... this. We can know from the primary sequence, we can get to predict, we can predict with absolute certainty what um, the resulting thing is going to look like. And we can test it and we can measure it. So we can make changes and we can see those changes. So can you see how powerful that is for information? We live in an age now where our information has got very slippery, okay? You know, we, we are, um, you know, we bombarded with, I mean, let's just say the protein sequences and genetic sequences are not quite the same as the words we use. They're made up of sequences of letters, let's say. That's what genetic information is. But whereas our words can get quite, um, I say they're a bit sort of loose at their edges. Their meaning can change depending on the context that they're used in. Genes are not quite like that. We can be quite sure about what um, a gene is doing and quite predictive of the changes we are making. Now, I want to actually use this moment because, uh, you know, I like, I like the odd metaphor. Um, and, and I want to take you, uh, I'm just going to turn this, um, I want to set up a, a machine to illustrate, I'm still here, to illustrate this idea of what I mean by information that is linear, okay, versus information that when it gets out into the greater world, and we see this all the time, especially in this age of Corona, where um, words in different contexts have very different meanings. Okay, they, their meanings can change. They can be quite slippery. They can be misinterpreted. Uh, it's harder to interpret. And that is the power of experimental science. That is the power of what empirical science has been able to allow us to do. We can actually go into the lab, make very specific changes to what we're trying to understand and measure those changes. And if we have the right controls, we can be certain. Well, we can be mostly certain about what it means. Of course, you know, the questions you ask do have an effect on the answers you're going to get. So it's not a perfect system, but we we'll, we can have a certain amount of objectivity which we don't have necessarily to the same extent in the real world. And people have certainly manipulated that idea. You know, that's what conspiracy theories are, I guess. I want to show you a machine that's called the peripheral machine, okay, to illustrate this point. Bear with me while I set it up. This will not take long, and hopefully it'll behave. Okay. 
Okay, follow me. Right, forgive the seasickness, it won't last long. Okay, so this here is what I call the peripheral machine, all right? Over here we have, um, you'll notice the turntables, okay? Now they, their motion is very predictable. The pattern of that drawing over there with that pen is frantically drawing, is highly mathematically predictable. There's nothing about it that a mathematician can't predict. It's a bit chaotic, a bit of a noise because it's the machine in the real world. Now what happens downstream when this thing starts interacting with the real world, right? So we have this perfect, almost perfect system, very linear, very predictable. We move along and it interacts with systems in the real world. Obviously the systems that I've built, so it's not quite the real world, but it's close enough. And if you look down there, you can see a much more chaotic pattern. The directed motion of those turntables is giving something highly unpredictable. And that, I think, really gets to the heart of perhaps a difference between, you know, the world of the laboratory, the world of the empirical science of at least genetics. It's the only science that I have a fair amount of experience in and versus how information behaves in the real world. So I wanted to point that out to you. Now I'm going to go and switch off the peripheral machine because it's making a noise. Excuse me a moment. Right, so I'm back. Um, now, what I want to do, talk to you about tonight, just pulling up a little, uh, some slides, is, again, obviously we're talking about a coronavirus, right? That's why we're here. And hopefully not just coronavirus, hopefully because we now, um, are maybe, I hope, are starting to appreciate, you know, some of the, I won't say magic of science because it's not a magic, but some of the uh, things that science is trying to do in, in the world. Now, I got a, I, there was an, um, a Nature News uh, article. Now, Nature is a very um, prominent uh, scientific journal. And they put out a news article and, you know, it was something I was slightly aware of. But, you know, I sent it to a friend of mine who's a geneticist in South Africa, a very brilliant geneticist actually and um you know there's this there's this um basically statement in the in the uh, news article where you know it's quite well known how the virus coronavirus is attached to cells they especially the SARS coronavirus the one that we're dealing with currently the um SARS coronavirus of 2003 as well had the same property they attached to a very specific receptor now there's a second thing that happens, all right? Um, so they attach to receptor, you got your virus here. In fact, give me one second. All right, let's, 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 let's say this is our virus over here, okay? All right, there it is. I'm just gonna get my chair comfortable. There's our virus, okay. Now these spiky things, not, this is not exactly how it looks, but it essentially looks a bit like this. These spiky things are called the spike protein. These attach to a cell, a very specific thing that sticks out of the human cell. It's in most cells actually, specific, but it's over abundantly expressed in cells of the uh, respiratory tract, uh, I think in blood vessels as well. Um, and that's how it attaches. But there's a second event that happens because what actually happens is the spike protein attaches to this thing sticking out of the cell. Can you see it over there? And then a second event happens and that's there's another um thing that must happen in order for this virus to be able to actually get inside that cell and that is this spike protein actually has to get cleaved okay it actually has to be cut all right and i'm not going to cut it because i don't want to damage my beautiful model over here but um, what that does that cutting exposes a, a part of the protein uh, which is actually behaves and this is really interesting. It actually behaves much like a detergent. It's called hydrophobic, the portion that gets exposed by that cutting action. And um, what hydrophobic really means is that it hates water. Hydrophobic is another way of saying it hates water. And 
it, it gets exposed and then it needs to get away from the water really quickly. And what it does is it intrudes into the membrane of the cell. And that is actually how the virus then gets into the cell and releases its genetic load and an infection is initiated. Okay, so that is, um, now, so that's all good and well. This is a reasonably well-known thing. Um, but what is really intriguing is that the protein that cuts this part of the spike protein is not a protein that's made by the virus. And that's not surprising because most viruses will steal, will use host cell machinery. So the protein they use is a protein called furin, okay? The word is furin, okay? That protein is a ubiquitous protein that is produced in um, most cells, a lot of cells, and it gets, and, and it, it basically, in addition to doing its own job, and the job of pro, these proteins, they are very busy proteins. There are lots of different kinds of proteins whose job it is to cut other proteins. Uh, but this one in particular is the furin protein. And what is really interesting about it, our dear friend, the coronavirus, is not the only virus that uses furin to cut its spike protein. HIV does. Um, human papillomavirus does, Ebola virus does, and um, MERS virus, which is also a coronavirus, also uses this. Interesting enough, and we'll get to that later, SARS of 2003, the famous first major uh, outbreak of SARS of coronavirus, doesn't actually use furin. But what's important about that, and what's slightly intriguing, and is, um, may, I, won't say, I won't use the word concerning, because it's, it's what happens, um, is that how is it possible that so many completely different viruses, I mean, Ebola is so different from coronaviruses, HIV, HIV is so vastly different from uh, coronaviruses, why are they using the same protein? How is that possible? What's the thing with this protein that it can recognize and what's the deal with viruses that they can use this, all these very different viruses can use the same protein to enter a cell? It's a good question. And um, part of why it's a pertinent question, and I don't get me wrong for one second, I don't buy into this, is that some people would argue, and I think have argued, is that this is a great argument for why this has been built in a laboratory, this coronavirus over here. This one was built in the studio, not in a laboratory, right? Um, but um, some Conspiracy theorists have used that uh, argument um, that, ah, oh, they've taken bits of HIV, they've stuck it onto this coronavirus. So, you know, um, a scientist must ask the question, like, how, that is a, that's a good question. I thought that's a good question. How, how is it possible that all these different viruses use the same mechanism? So that is what tonight's chat is about and and um in addition to what it's about is it's also about what i showed you that that machine there also how we can go into the laboratory and ask those very directed questions and get very directed answers that we can be sure of what is it about this field of study and it's not just viruses anything to do with genes where you're getting down to the primary sequence of genes you can start asking these questions so that's why i really wanted to um use it as a to talk about this example of furin again just to remind you furin is this host protein i.e made by your own cells and it comes along and cuts the spike protein and helps the virus get into your cells it seems like a why would the cell do that i mean it's, these are all really good questions um all right so that's the mystery like why why does the same um protease uh, this furin help coronaviruses? Why does it help Ebola virus? Why is it helping HIV enter our cells? So the most important thing, the first thing is when a um, protein from a cell um, is going to cut another protein, all right? So here's our, let's just pretend, pretend now, okay, we, uh, that this is a, this is furin coming along like a scissor, all right? And it's going to cut, it can't cut anywhere. It's not designed to do that. It's got to cut at a very, very specific part. Yeah, it is. Can it cut the spike protein? Now, in order for a protein to cut another protein, it's got to recognize it first. Okay, it's got to be able to see it. And the way it does that is it's able to read the amino acids. There's a sequence. Everything in genetics, you'll see is a sequence. 
DNA, RNA is a sequence. The proteins are a sequence. Like letters of a word, they are sequences of, and that's what gives the meaning, all right? So my initial thought was, if it's a long sequence that the, um, this host protein is, has to recognize, that makes it extremely unlikely that so many different viruses would be able to, on their own evolution, evolve to recognize that very long sequence. But a quick search of the literature, and I don't want to get you bogged down in the literature because it gets a bit complicated, but uh, you know, there's lots of reviews out there. It's a very well understood system. Tells you quickly that actually the uh, sequence that uh, this protease recognizes and please, these are just amino, re refer to amino acids. There's only one, two, three, four bits of information long. And it's not even that specific. There's a little bit of looseness. It's a bit like the word, uh, what's a word that is spelt? Um, uh, I wish my wife was in here. She'd tell me in a second. Uh, words that's, that's, that are the same word spelled differently, two different meanings. Um, homonyms or like let's ah you see now I'm, I'm in a trap i can't think of the word but imagine two different words spelled slightly differently but have the same meaning all right that's like that so there's a lot of looseness there's a lot of um room for error there uh room for movement let's say so basically all that that means is that our dear protease can come along here and quite neatly cut and it's quite easy for that sequence to evolve. That's the point. Natural selection, this sequence would evolve many times very easily, especially if there's selection for it, i.e. it gives it some useful property, and especially because we're dealing with RNA viruses. And remember that RNA viruses, what's the big dogma around RNA viruses is they mutate really fast, okay? So it's really not hard to see how the same sequence can emerge and arise in different viruses, completely different viruses. That is not a challenge to me to, to, to see that. So, that. so that makes a lot of sense. So I'm, I'm quite comfortable to think that it actually makes sense that these things would be in different, completely different viruses. And given the, the um, you know, uh, think about also how fantastically useful it is, is that in a single protein like our spike protein, you have two vastly different functions. Imagine your words could do that. Imagine your word could have, depending on how you spin it, could have two different meanings. Now, I think we have some words that do that. In fact, if you can think of some, put them in the comments there, all right? Words that do that, okay? So that is, um, that is uh, easy to see how this sort of thing can arise. Now, what I really wanted to do was, I wanted to take, use as an example, another one of these viruses, because I'm, I'm, to be honest, sick to death of hearing about this coronavirus. We'll get back to it in a minute, don't worry. But um, I wanted to, let's take another virus and let's see how this protease, this furin, can be studied and can, how they've come to learn about what it does. I want to take you into the lab. Now this is slightly, um, I, I, I'll say technical, but actually I think it's really important because that's how you can get an insight into how things are actually done. That's what can make you more uh, confident about um, understanding what it is that we know about uh, virology, about science, about genetics, and why it's such a powerful field of study, um, which is not subject to a lot of the, um, I won't say noise, but a lot of the things we hype conjecture is, is a very important part of their fields. This one is quite directed. You get your answers by doing quite simple things. It's not terribly hard. And, it, you know, uh, I'm going to admit this, you know, like what is hard about working in a laboratory is, is, the, is the technicalities, is growing the cells, is... Uh, but the actual ideas, they can be arrived at quite... Um, without too much difficulty if, you, if you're reasonably competent got to think about certain things but usually if you're a competent scientist you can get quite far in understanding the systems that you work in. So we're going to look at the example of the human papillomavirus all right um, all right so this this is a just a, a slide now I've actually uh, I must point this out to you notice the birds all right now the birds I've just put in there because they are reminders to me of what I'm trying to be t I'm talking to you about because uh, my brain is not it, it can, can fly all over the place sometimes. So I'm trying to keep it um, reasonably close to earth. So that's, this bird is telling me that, ah, the human papillomavirus also use furin. So 
he has a really interesting phenomenon that um, makes it really interesting and nice to work with viruses. They can do this one thing. And, and, and I'll give you, actually, this is my, just to, just to prove to you that I've actually worked on viruses, this is a study I did, and all the way back in 1998, like that's what that, about 50 years ago, um, you know, I was working as in an area a bit like this, doing this kind of work. But what you can do, now this is amazing, you can take the viruses of the coat, okay, and this is not true for all viruses, but it is true for um, a good few, uh, quite a few viruses. Um, but, but you can take the coat proteins, just these spiky bits, and this is not necessarily true for coronavirus. Um, I don't think it is. I'm not sure, to be totally honest. But you can take the surface proteins of a virus, the shell proteins, all these proteins here, you can mix them in a test tube, and they will literally form a virus, what's called a virus-like particle. This is what they look like, all right? This is a group, uh, an Iranian group, that showed with human papillomavirus uh, that they can make in a test tube these virus-like particles. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a second because these virus-like particles are actually a great vaccine candidate, okay? They are used in certain vaccines. There's companies out there and laboratories um, that are making virus-like particles. I'll just show you again, and I'm jumping around ever so slightly, but bear with me. Um, there's even companies out there, this is one in Cape Town, that is taking virus-like particles and growing them in tobacco plants. When they're planning on feeding these to horses, um, I don't know if they're going to feed it to them in the tobacco plant, I'm not sure. But the point is you can actually do some really clever recombinant, it's called recombinant DNA technology, biotechnology, and start feeding animals vaccines as a possible way of delivering vaccines to ward off terrible diseases like African horse sickness. So that's a slight aside. Um, right. Now, so, the, so, so the point is you can do this kind of technology. You can make not actual viruses, very important, because these viruses don't contain the genetic material, but you can do the most amazing experiments. Because the great thing about this is you know, because you've taken in a test tube, the proteins that come from the shell over here, right? And you've mixed them together and you get this. Okay, so you can actually make, mimic the virus in a test tube. And then you can do some really cool experiments with it. So I want to run through a couple of those experiments, if I may. And I may, because I'm just sitting here doing it, so I can just do it. And uh, just to see how you arrive at some really interesting results. And then I'm going to get to coronavirus, because I want to just share its different strategies and the way it uses this protease to get into cells. So this is a publication um, that was published in 2006, so a little while ago. Um, remember I said things, things take time. So, you know, this story has been building over years, and this is a certain point in the story where they were able to discover that one of the proteins that sits on this, on this um, shell, even though it isn't necessary to bind to the host cell, it is necessary for if the virus needs it to infect the cell. So in that very simple statement, they were able to use, show in a test tube, the very specific job that just one protein is able to do. That is high resolution understanding of what a virus is able to do. Okay, so they show that um, you can make the shells, but you have to have the second protein in the shell, so there are two proteins in the shell. The one is just to make the shell. The second one you have to have if you want the virus to actually get into the cell. Right, so I'm gonna run through a couple of just what the results look like, how you would do such an experiment. So they took these um, empty virus shells um, and they, were, they put a little bit of um, genetic material inside it, but not from the virus, just what's called the reporter gene. It's a gene where they can actually track to see where the virus is going in the cell. They could look, all right? And what they did is they took these cells, they grew inside a test tube, all right? These are cells. In fact, the cells are themselves really interesting because these are what are called HeLa cells, right? H-E-L-A. Now, this is another really interesting story. So the cells they used to do their experiments with came from, this is a great story, 
Um, and it's a really interesting story, the sociology of science, right? In the 19, I think it was the 1950s, maybe even a bit earlier, there was an African-American woman by the name of Henrietta Lacks. She had cervical cancer, and I think she died. But the doctors at the time, and you could never do this now, thank heavens, harvested her cells, and they, and they found that they were immortal. That's typical of a cancer cell, right? They could grow forever if they just gave it some nutrients. So these cells are used even today, even today, from this one person. They've been passaged over and over again. They've been used in millions of laboratories. I think I've even used them. I'm trying to remember all that. I'm trying to remember back. But they're used for virus infections, for all sorts of experiments to understand our own biology. So it's, it's really interesting, uh, that, that side story. But what this group did is they took chemicals called protease inhibitors, right? Remember, our protein that cuts the spike is a protease, uh, is a pro it's called a protease, which is a fancy word for saying it's a protein that cuts proteins, all right? It's an enzyme that cuts proteins. They took little molecules because they've been designed and this has happened over the 30, 40 years of research. They've got lots of chemicals now that do very specific things. Remember I talked about that specificity. This science has a lot of specificity. Now, they were able to take different protease inhibitors and they found that the protease inhibitor that inhibits our famous furin protease completely inhibits the um the virus from getting into the cell so they were showing in a very simple experiment that if you inhibit the furin protease the virus cannot enter the cell right can you see that one-to-one -one relationship between the question asked by the scientist and the answer they got but if they're good scientists they will not be satisfied with that answer because you've always got to be sure there might be other things going on so you want to go a little bit deeper in what does my little bird say over there? Tested the ability there. Okay, so the inhibitor worked. Um, next they entered, because if you're going to publish these results, you've got to be sure that you could, that's not enough. You can't just say that, because there might be other reasons uh, why the protease inhibitor is stopping the virus into the cell. You just don't know. So what they did is they got a cell line, not Henrietta Lacks' cell line, the Heller cells. They got another cell line which doesn't produce protease. It's been genetically engineered to have its furin gene removed. So it can no longer make furin. And what they found is in cells that produce furin, like the Heller cell, boom, you get the virus entering the cell. But in the cells that don't make furin, they're unable to, the virus cannot get in. Right? Now, they did a good, they did a good control, right? They gave that cell that is unable to make its own furin. They said, okay, we'll help you out. We'll give you a lot of furin. They did that, and the virus could get in. That's a pretty convincing experiment to show that the virus works, that the, vi that the furin is really important. But remember that on our virus-like particle, we've got two proteins, right? We've got the L, the, these two proteins, the shell protein and this other protein, L2, which I said was necessary for infection. So this is the other great thing you can do, right? You can actually, to make my point, you can actually now, in um, in a laboratory, you can the cell the proteins you want to use you can purify. You can actually get them so that you only know you have this protein here, the one the one protein, and you have the other protein. I mean, you keep them perfectly separated. You can now study what exactly what it is that these proteins of the virus do because you know they are pure and isolated. Okay, and so that's what they did. They isolated this protein which they suspected was the one that the furin was cutting, all right? Bear with me on this, all right? Uh, we all, we, we're nearly out of the water. And if you know this, it's, it, I think it hopefully will be an enriching experience. So what we have, we have these purified proteins. Now, this is how clever DNA technology is and, and working with proteins. Once you've got their DNA, you know exactly what the protein looks like, all right? So this, they were able to make the protein there's the protein they were interested in, and they found by reading its DNA, it had something that looked a lot, and I'm just doing it obviously symbolically here, yeah, a lot like a, um, the consensus sequence for the furin to recognize. So they say, ah, it looks like furin is able to cut this protein. That is fantastic, all right? So what they did is they put a tag, which is another small protein. They put that on the end of it, okay? 
And they did that so they can measure its activity. Remember what I said about measuring? They could measure its behavior when they're subjected to certain experiments. Then they took the same protein, but they mutated it. They changed the sequence that the furin recognizes by one or two, they gave it one or two mutations that should make it that it doesn't work. So they would know that if it doesn't work, it will behave differently to the one that does work, right? So that's what they did. They took the protein. This is the one that does work. This is the one that exists in the virus. This is the one they're interested in. Here's the mutant, and that's an important control. Can you see? They always have to have controls. You want your results to have integrity. Really the most important thing. Um, this over here is a um, uh, what's called a Western blot. All right, Don't worry about it, but it's a way of actually re seeing a protein. A protein is obviously incredibly small. You can't see it even with the most powerful electron microscope. But you can see it if you're subjected to certain chemical treatments. And uh, this is what they essentially did. So what they did is they took this protein, okay, and they treated it with furin. They took furin, that protein, as it cuts the, the, uh, the protein, and they showed that they were getting... Um, this is the one with the furin, all right? They could see they've lost the tag. The tag has been cut off. So in other words, the furin protease has cut it just over there, and that tag has gone off somewhere, and they were able... It's gone. You can see there with a plus. And there's the rest of the protein. They could still detect that, but they were unable to detect the little tag because it had been cut off. But importantly, in the control, where they had made a mutant, you were... It was not cutting it. You could detect the tag and you could detect the whole protein. So I really wanted to show you this because it really gives you an insight into how they come to say certain things. That, oh, this furin protein is used by coronaviruses to enter cells. What do they mean by that? How do they actually go about showing it? I think it's really important to know that. Or, or just really interesting. Right, so this is my intellectual bird making a point over here. Unlike in, so what they also did show, and that's not really what I want to get into right now, unlike in coronaviruses, this um, papillomavirus uses furin. This actually is quite important because whereas our coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, uses furin to get into the cell, um, the papillomavirus actually uses the furin to escape into a different part of the cell. So it's actually got a very different function. So it's necessary for its infection process, but it uses to escape an internal, because you must remember inside a cell, it's full of membranes and things that, you know, the virus will have to get through. So they have different strategies to achieve that. So that is, um, right. Now, quickly want to get to the coronavirus and why, um, yeah, what is it about the coronavirus and it's the furin and how it's able to use that to get into different cells and why, you know, what's the deal with all these different cells? Um, what's really important to understand is that it's really easy. Remember I was saying earlier that the sequence is really short. It, uh, these furin-like things can emerge quite easily. Now, what's really interesting is that, um, I'll just go this way for a sec, is that so let's just quickly have a look here. This is this is um, the spike protein. I've just drawn it as a straight line to show that it's a gene. Now, what's really interesting is that COV-2, the one our virus has got one um, furin cleavage site, all right? So the furin comes on, and cuts it there, gets in there. It's very close relative. SARS, the coronavirus of the 2003 outbreak in Hong Kong, doesn't even have a furin site. It's a similar virus, but it doesn't use furin. And that reminds us that cells and humans and, and all sorts of animals have so many different kinds of proteases. And I think the story with SARS-CoV, not COV-2, COV is that it just uses a different protease. But what's really interesting is that MERS has got two. So it's a very similar virus, but it actually has two furin cleavage sites. It uses them for different parts of its infection process. What I wanted to say about that is those subtle differences give the virus many options, right? So subtle differences in, in those cleavage sites allow it to change the kinds of cells it can actually infect. I put this up here because this is a study 
this is just some some literature 1983 and 2000 i mean and studies like have been done like this for many viruses and this is influenza and i'm not going to get into that now but just to say a single change in the c in the letter of a protein that sits on the surface of the influenza virus is enough to change its host range okay now that is huge that means that it takes so little change genetic change for a virus to be able to behave to have quite a fundamentally different behavior that is really something to keep in mind and probably why coronaviruses have got such flexibility in terms of how they can go from a, a bat to a pangolin to a human uh, so many different kinds into different animals like a camel you know depending on the coronavirus specifically they've got a lot of genetic flexibility and i think that's really interesting and important so um what I want to say, yeah, so I just wanted to tell you this story just to end things off. Um, this is the, the feline. There's a coronavirus, one of the earlier coronaviruses that have been understood and very well characterized, okay, because it's been known about for a long time, of, of coronaviruses that infect cats. Now, I just wanted to mention this one example because there's one coronavirus that infects cats. Now, usually when a cat gets infected with it, it just gets persistently infected and it gets a bit of a tummy ache and it can last a, quite a long time and it gets pretty miserable, but it's not terrible, all right? And, and um, you know, it, it can seem that it can live with it quite happily. But sometimes over, after a long period of time, this virus, this nice, well, persistent one that's not causing too much damage, suddenly becomes virulent, okay? So these scientists said, well, what's happened? Because what actually seems to have happened is it's now gone from being able to infect the intestines, all right, the cells around the intestine, to suddenly being able to infect cells of the immune system, the monocytes and macrophages. What has happened? What kind of major genetic event must have happened to this virus to allow it to do that? So they did an experiment, and this is going to boil down to that spike protein again, but I wanted to show you this clever experiment very briefly. They were able to chop up. Now, one thing about coronavirus is they recombine quite readily. They can, you can mix their, their genetic instructions up with other coronaviruses. So what they were able to they took a persistent one and they basically chopped up its genetic material. Or I'm not sure exactly how they did it. They might have done it in vivo, actually done in vivo experiments inside a, a host animal or just gone into the laboratory and chopped it up and selected for a viable uh, recombinants. I'm not sure how they did that. But essentially what they did is they swapped out bits from uh, the persistent one with bits of the virulent one. And they were able, using that kind of mapping technique by getting all the different combinations, find that it was actually by swapping out that part of the spike protein that is important for furin, not furin cleavage, but for um, accessing the cell. So very much like the equivalent of uh, the spike that is cleaved by our SARS-CoV-2, they were able to show that changes in that gene, in that protein, were enough to allow it to change what cells it infects. So I hope you got from that that it's, it's really um, this ability to be able to very tightly resolve the structure, i.e. the sequence of the genes, to the function of the genes, to be able to go so reasonably easily from the structure to what the genes, the behavior of the product of the gene, i.e. the protein, and correspondingly the behavior of the virus. And of course, viruses are simple, so it's a bit easier to do than if it was a human or a bacteria even. But viruses are a bit simpler, so you can actually get quite a good handle on it. So I hope you can see that the way, you know, that one of the reasons it takes time to really get to the heart of what is going on here, but that if, if you allow the process to happen and because of the way the genes work and the, the way we're able to get information from them, we can learn quite a lot about their behavior. So that's actually all I wanted to say. Um, that is all I wanted to say. So yes, it was lovely to hang out again and uh, I'm sure we'll chat again soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.